Now, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, it's not particularly clement weather, but um, you will, I think, find it well worth your while to have come to, to hear this wonderful session. So my job is to uh, introduce Sarah Hickson, who is going to be talking to Ben Rawlins, the author of City of Thorns. So Sarah comes back to Galway after a hugely successful exhibition and set of talks here during the, the summer. We were privileged to see her luminous, beautifully informative and respectful photographs of the so-called Calais jungle and to hear her talk about the resourceful inhabitants of that forbidding place and the successful attempts to create facilities like shops, restaurants, a library and churches from little or nothing and to transform chaos into civic order. The exhibition also focused on the musicians from many different countries in the camp, and they're coming together to create the Calais Sessions, a testament to cross-border creative collaboration in the most difficult of circumstances. It's probably one of the most inspiring exhibitions I have ever seen, and I often uh, return to those photographs online. Sarah is a distinguished photographer who's produced work from places like Mali, Burkina Faso, Morocco, Senegal, and India. And despite her fabulously stylish presence here today, she's just back from the Sahara Desert, where she has been carrying out another project. So we're very delighted to have her here today to talk with Ben Rawlins, another superb chronicler of people living in extreme circumstances. Please welcome Sarah Hickson. Thank you, Katrina. I'm really delighted to be back in Galway and even more delighted to be here with Ben Rawlins this morning as part of the First Thought Talks winter programme. It's quite hard to say that, First Thought Talks, actually. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to introduce Ben to start with. Ben Rawlins is a writer and human rights activist. From 2006 to 2013, he was a researcher for Human Rights Watch Africa Division, covering at different times the Horn of Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda and Zanzibar. He's worked as a political advisor for the Civic United Front, a liberal party in Tanzania, and as foreign affairs, foreign affairs advisor to the UK Liberal Democrats. He's written for the New York Times, The Guardian, and London Review of Books. Ben holds a BA in Swahili and African Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, and an MA in International Relations from the University of Chicago. He's clearly someone who knew from an early age in which direction he was heading. He's written two books. His first book, Radio Congo, Signals of Hope from Africa's Deadliest War, was published in 2012 and is about people living amidst war in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. His second book, published in 2016, is called City of Thorns, Nine Lives in the World's Largest Refugee Camp and is the book we're talking about today. Ben first visited the refugee camp of Dadaab, the City of Thorns of the book's title, in 2010 when he was working as a researcher for Human Rights Watch. The camp on the eastern Kenyan border with Somalia had originally been established in 1992 to house 90,000 people fleeing the civil war in Somalia. At the time of Ben's first visit, Dadaab was already home to around 300,000 people. Ben returned there in 2011 and spent the next four years making extended visits, researching and following the stories of individuals who lived there and witnessing the enormous growth of the camp into a sprawling, informal city, which by 2016 reached a population of half a million people, comparable in size to the city of Bristol, Zurich, or New Orleans. A city made of mud, tents, and thorns, with no sewage system, no sanitation, no power, no proper roads, in the middle of the desert. The Guardian newspaper described City of Thorns as a superb work that highlights the essential humanity of those faceless masses buffeted by events and desperately seeking salvation in one of the world's most troubled spots. The New York Times referred to it as an ambitious, morally urgent new book. And the Wall Street Journal said that Rawlins's major feat was stripping away the anonymity that so often is attached to the word refugee by delving deeply into the lives of nine people in the camp. So Ben is going to start by setting the context and telling a story from City of Thorns. 
Then he and I are going to have a conversation and explore some of the questions around displacement, migration and home that his book raises. We'd love to hear your thoughts too, so there'll be time for questions towards the end of the talk. And then at the end, Ben will be signing copies of his book, City of Thorns, at the far back of the room. So Ben, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm, I'm mic'd up. You can hear me? So I'm going to speak from here rather than there, if, if that's all right. You can all see me? Should I stand up? That might be easier. Um, Paul asked me to set the scene to give you a taste of what this place is like. And that's quite a hard thing to do. The natural inclination would be to put a big picture up here to show you from the air what the dab looks like. If you can imagine, this is the problem, imagine 500,000 people spread out in what looks like Atlanta from the air, a sort of planned city with all these different urban districts. But because that's quite difficult, I find often images create more distance than words. And my tools of the trade are words. Sarah's very good with pictures. But unless you, you're very adept at taking photos and often bringing the stories behind the photos to play, then sometimes images can actually make more, create more distance than, uh, and actually can confuse more than explain. So what I'd like to do this morning is a little thought experiment, if you don't mind. We're going to tell, I'm going to tell you a story, but I'm going to start by asking you to close your eyes and imagine you're in a classroom, any classroom that you've been in before, with other children, probably, looking at a blackboard with a teacher. And it's the middle of the morning, and the sun is shining, and the birds are tweeting outside. It's a very normal, familiar scene that you've been in many times. The teacher stands up at the front of the class, writes the day's date in the left-hand corner, and on the right-hand corner writes today's subject, geography. And then the teacher walks to the middle of the classroom, turns round, and looks at the back of the class, and the door gets kicked open, and seven armed men walk into the middle of the classroom with AK-47s. You can open your eyes now. Those seven men circle the classroom, and they ask all the boys to stand up. Stay sitting, it's okay. But Those boys stand up, then they walk around, and they pick the tallest ones, the ones who they think can handle a weapon. And then they walk them out the back of the class, and outside the school is a technical, what the Somalis call a technical, which is a Toyota pickup truck with the back sawn off, um, and they load, and usually with a, a big anti-aircraft gun welded onto the back. And they mount those eight boys that they thought were old enough into the back of the car, and they drive them off through the streets of Mogadishu, because that's where we are. And one of the boys in that truck was a guy called Guled. And Guled, on that day, was 15 years old. And he was taken to a training camp just outside Mogadishu, and for the next month was taught how to strip a weapon, how to, um, uh, how to police people, how to crowd, crowd control. Um, he was fed, he was indoctrinated in uh, extreme Islam that was not his own faith. And he was enlisted into what Al-Shabaab call the Hizbat. And the Hizbat are the police in Mogadishu or in areas controlled by al-Shabaab. So extremists like al-Shabaab, once they've actually won control over an area, what they then want to do is to police the population and try and make that population obey their law. And that's quite a tough sell, because people generally don't want to live that way. So what Guled had to do every day was go out into the streets of Mogadishu, make sure that when the muezzin called for the, the prayer, the time of prayer, that all the shops were shut, that everybody was going to the mosque. If he found somebody listening to music on their mobile phone, they used to smash the phone and make that person swallow the SIM card. If they found somebody smoking, they used to burn their face with a cigarette. Uh, and one time they came across some children who were buying vegetables in a, at a stall at the time of prayer, and they had to beat those children. 
They screamed at them, told them to lie on the ground. They were given whips, and they then had to go and beat those children. And only as he was whipping did Guled realize that one of those girls was his girlfriend from school. And of course, they recognized each other, but they had to keep quiet. Because if they did show any recognition, they probably both may have ended up dead. Now, after a month of this, Guled managed to escape. It's a long story, chapter three, you have to read the book. <laughs> he managed to escape. He made it 400 miles south to the border with Kenya because he had heard, as everybody in Somalia has heard, about this city, this huge refugee city, which is where you go. When you can't stomach Somalia anymore, when you've got, um, when life has become too tough or you're, somebody's been killed or you're starving, you go to Dadaab, to this refugee city. And he'd heard wonderful things about it. He heard, maybe you can go to America. Maybe you can get an education. And he wanted to continue his education because it had been cut short in, by al-Shabaab. But when he got to the border, eventually, there isn't really, it's not like Calais or, you know, the, the borders that we talk about in Europe. It's just a line in the sand. And he's looking out over the desert and he's told that the camp is three days walk that way. And unless you've got water or a camel, don't even think about it. So eventually he stows himself away on a truck, finds his way to the camp. And when he gets to the camp, he sees, as, uh, as um, you can imagine, he sees this city that we've talked about. These tiny huts, each hut about this big, made of mud and sticks, and then with a tin roof, if you're lucky, or with a plastic UNHCR tarp. And there are around 150,000 of these, one after the other in these huge long lines, kilometers of streets. Um, and they've got names, and they've got numbers. And then in the middle is a huge aircraft. It looks like an airport. It's these, air, these big hangars controlled by the World Food Program. So for five days, he sort of wanders around, tries to make sense of this place. He eventually gets directed to the UN, where he goes to register. He gets his biometrics taken, photograph. Um, he gets an injection. He gets a ration card, which is your passport in the camp. And he goes, after five days of being hungry, he finally makes it through the, um, through the camp to the warehouse. And then he files through this warehouse where you go through bulletproof glass, you get your ration card stamped, you get a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, a little bit of beans. And then he gets, you get sort of spat out of this sausage machine at the other end <clears throat> into the sand. And right next to the food distribution is the market because of course what everybody wants in the in in the refugee camp apart from food is cash but the only thing you can monetize is the food that the UN gives you because there's no other way of getting any money so the first thing Guled does after he gets his little handful of food from this warehouse is he goes to the market and he sells it and he gets three dollars and he buys a scratch card, he goes to the phone shop, and he phones his family, his aunt and his girlfriend, back in Mogadishu, and he says, I'm safe. I made it. And they say, wow, what's it like? Because everybody's heard the stories of this camp, this amazing land of milk and honey where you can go to America and you can get an education. And he didn't really know, because he hadn't been there very long, but he'd heard all these stories as well, and he thought, well, it's a bit of a shithole, but maybe it's true. So he started spinning a yarn. He said, well, it's great. There's, there's education, there's food. I've just been to the food reception. There's, I'm waiting on the wait list for a tent. The tent never arrived, but he didn't know that then. So he span this story about how great it was. And his aunt and his girlfriend said, well, brilliant. Send us $50 so we can come. And then he thought, oh my God, where am I going to get $50? So he started trying to lift sacks in the market to carry 50 kilo loads, almost his own body weight. But he couldn't do it, and it's a closed shop. And he tried to shoe shining, but he didn't have the stuff. You need $5 to invest to start that business. He had no means of, of getting, any, getting any money. So it was a very long time before his girlfriend managed to come. 
But, again, long story, you'll have to read the book for the details, but his girlfriend did make it. And finally, when she got there a few months later, she was horrified. She said, this really is a shithole. This is terrible. It's really hot. There's no food. It's full of refugees. She didn't consider herself a refugee. She said, in Mogadishu, we had a washing machine. This is terrible. She had to go and get the water from the tap all the time. Plus, she wanted fruit, she wanted meat, she wanted vegetables because she was pregnant, which she had actually just got pregnant at school. I mean, it's not great, I know, but this is the story. These people aren't angels. She, before he'd been kidnapped, she had, been, she had gotten pregnant, but he didn't know that. So she came, actually, when she was six months pregnant and had to give birth in the camp in this terrible situation, which... Lots of people refer to as hell on earth, and, and it is a kind of hell on earth. But the bizarre thing and the starting point for our conversation is that this is the place where you come. And it is awful, but if you want to come here, you have to be completely desperate. And that's why I started with imagining in the classroom, because that is the chain of events that leads people to come to this situation about which so many stories are told, but the only way to really understand the reality of the whole is through an intense focus on some of the individual lives. And that's what I've tried to do in the book. And of course, there's more in the book. But just for now, I've brought you to the camp, I hope. And now we can talk about it. Thank you. That was great, Ben. Thank you so much for setting the scene. So the camp has existed for over 25 years now. You describe it in the prologue of the book, I think it was when you were reporting to the National Security Council, you describe it in the, in the prologue as a teeming ramshackle metropolis. And I'd like to start by asking you about the first time you visited in 2010, what your first impressions were, what struck you during that very first visit? Yeah, well, it blew my mind. I went there for Human Rights Watch, who I used to work for, um, to report on refugee uh, on the problems in Somalia and we used to go there to interview recently arrived people to find out what was happening in Somalia but actually what really ex um, alarmed and, and fascinated me was this place itself was how on earth do, do people survive here what's why are there cinemas and hotels and restaurants and markets and this whole life um, in this place that has existed that shouldn't really exist um, for all this time. So I was completely taken immediately, and I thought, well, this is my... I've got to write about this. Why don't I understand about this place? Why haven't I heard about it? And I thought other people would be interested and should be interested. Um, and so that really set, set me off straight away. Mm -hmm. So in City of Thorns, you draw the reader into the lives of these nine people whose individual stories, as you've already witnessed... Talk, you tell them so vividly and compassionately against this backdrop of the very complex and multi-layered political, historical, economic, environmental context. Why was it important for you to tell the story of Dadaab in this way? And, and how did you go about finding the people whose stories you wanted to tell and then piecing together convincingly those really detailed narratives of their experiences? Well, I... My first interest was, is I'm always starting to think about, for me, writing is political. So I'm trying, I'm trying to, and I mean that not in a, in a narrow sense, but in the sense that I'm trying to make people care. Um, if I care about something, I want other people to care about it as well. And this situation to me uh, was fascinating, but also deeply depressing. And I thought we need to understand it better. And if you simply lecture people about this situation, everybody's going to turn off. Actually, there's got to be an element of empathy, there's got to be an element of, of entertainment, of mystery, um, of, try, of wanting to understand. And I think the, the way you do that is through looking at the traditional tools of fiction, of storytelling. Um, and that, for me, that's what good reportage is. It's actually, it should be aiming towards literature as a goal rather than news. Um, so the challenge was then to how to do that. And I think the way to do that is to put you in the shoes of individuals because they're live. Everybody in Dadaab has a story. If you've got there, you've got a story. So <clears throat> in a way, you're spoilt for choice. 
So I was looking for individuals who could illuminate the whole. And I wanted a spread. I wanted some people who just come, some people who were born there, whose parents were born there, um, men, women, um, some rich, some poor, and so on. So I interviewed probably about 100 people. And then the first year, I followed about 16 of them. And then we got down to about 12. And then in the last year, I was just focused on the, the nine that ended up in the book. Um, but the goal was exactly that, to, ta to take you there through their eyes so you hopefully see and feel the camp as they do um, rather than through the eyes of a, a white journalist, which is not so interesting, mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard you talking about City of Thorns in London, it was just a few months after the book came out, and you quoted, I remember very clearly remembering this, this, this phrase from the book that struck a chord for me, um, and resonated with many of the stories I'd heard from people I met in refugee camps in, in northern France and Serbia and Greece. You said, to flee, one needed three things, money, courage, and imagination. And I think those are things that one can relate to many people who are forced to abandon their homes, flee conflict, war, persecution, extreme poverty. Can you tell us a bit more about why those three elements are so necessary? Well, if we take the story of Guled... He's living in Mogadishu, he's going to school, he's working part-time in a, driving a minibus, trying to get some cash. He's living in a bombed-out um, house with his sister near where he was born. He's got friends, he plays soccer in the evenings in the, in the football stadium. Yes, the night sky is lit up by Kayatusha rockets, and yes, there is a front line that's moving around the city, but mostly you listen to the radio and you avoid those places and, you know, you have a life. Mm -hmm. And to, to change, to move out of any habitual situation into another one is a huge leap of imagination. You've got to imagine that the unknown is going to be better than the known. And even though that known might be awful, you don't know what's going on in Kenya or anywhere else down in the south of Somalia. So it's a huge leap of faith in a way a leap of courage, which is why you've got to have some, some guts to do it. And you need cash, because that bus journey from Mogadishu down to the border with Somalia is 400 miles, and it costs $20. And $20 is a lot of money. Mm. Um, and if, that, if you can only afford the bus fare, you probably need some other cash in hand as well. And if you're making longer journeys, for example, the young guys, mostly guys, who go from Dadaab to Europe that journey costs $10,000. So and that's an even bigger leap because everybody knows that there are challenges on that, on that, on that journey. So yes, it, you need resources. You've got, to be, you've got to be resilient. You've got to be imaginative. You've got to be determined. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in this, this question of imagination and how that also contributes to hope, which is so vital for anyone living in a, in a refugee camp. And you've, you've told us a little bit about... about Guled and, and phoning his wife, his young wife, his girlfriend, was she still his girlfriend at the time? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and persuading her that this would be a good idea and she leaps onto that and then is bitterly disappointed when, when she gets there. Um, there's this word that you talk about, which is leaping a bit further on into the book, but it sort of comes from here, I think. We talk, touched on it a bit earlier this morning, this idea of hope and denial, but there's this word that you said was coined in Dada called Bufis. Yeah. Can you explain what that means and where that comes from? <clears throat> well, if you can imagine living in this city, all around you is the desert in pretty much every direction for hundreds of miles. You can't, it's a prison because you can't cross that desert. The road down into Kenya towards Nairobi, there's a, there are roadblocks all the way along. Um, and if you're a refugee without Kenyan papers, you're taken back, you're put in jail, you're detained and you're taken back to the refugee camp. You don't really want to go back to Somalia. That way is open if you wanted to go, but nobody wants to go because the war in Somalia is still going on. Um, and not to mention for three generations, people have lived there. They've made a home there. They've been to school there. They've buried their parents in the ground. <coughs> so it's a familiar community. Um, but that brings with it terrible mental health costs. So probably around 25% of young people in the camp have some kind of mental health problem. And there's a word that they've, uh, a new vocabulary that they've coined in the camp called bufis, and it basically means your feet 
are in the refugee camp, but your head is in Europe or America. You're dreaming of another life. And in a way, it's a rational response to, to being incarcerated because the only way you can keep living with your feet in this camp is to imagine that there is a future for you somewhere else. And Somalia is closed, Kenya is closed, so uh, the rich world or another world is the only way. Um, and that means that you're, you, know, you get kind of twisted and people get... You, you see all these young men standing by the side of the road just vacant and listless and without any kind of any agency because they're just waiting. There's no point living in the, in the camp. You're just waiting for your life to start somewhere else. You know? And sometimes you spend your whole life waiting. Mm. And there's no support for that kind of mental health treatment. No, in no, the no, camp. no, 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 no. One of the other paradoxes of a, of a refugee camp like Dadaab is the fact that people are not allowed to work and they're not really able to leave, as you've just explained, yet they have to find a way to survive in this incredible, you know, times of such adversity. And that is obviously a testament to their resilience and ingenuity and entrepreneurship. Can you tell us something a bit about how the economy works? You touched on it earlier, talking about the market and how people generate cash, but there is yeah. this whole kind of quite nuanced grey market that functions at many different levels in the camp. Well, I think if you put people anywhere, they will, they will, they will start by exchanging things and creating an economy. Um, whether they're allowed to work or not, that will happen. Um, I mean, that's, you look at the economy in America started from somewhere. And it, these, the original refugees in the camp in the 90s uh, sold a little bit of food. Some people talk about going hungry for a year or two years because they're only eating half their rations and they're selling the rest to build up a nest egg. And then they buy a crate of tomatoes and they start a tomato selling business and then they start selling other things and then it, it grows. So for some of those families who came originally in the first wave of refugees in the 90s, they have now built up huge businesses. They're renting trucks to the aid agencies, they've got a hotel, they've got a generator making ice, they've got an ice cream factory, um, all sorts of stuff going on. And if you're a newcomer like Gouled, you're trying to find a way into that world to get some cash. Because the, the, the rations when they're not cut, and they are frequently cut, um, are just enough to survive. So the World, Health, um, the World Food Programme says you need 1,525 kilocalories a day, or whatever it is. And that is calculated in terms of a mix of pulses, um, carbohydrate, oil, and salt. And that's what you get, that's what we pay for. We, the international community, give that to, to refugees. And that's a standard package. But often it's cut by 50% or 30%. Um, and then it's only enough for a week instead of two weeks. And then you're hungry anyway. But so the saying goes into Dab, well, if I can survive being hungry for a week, I might as well survive being hungry for a week the rest of the time and save the balance. So people are always hungry. The price of ambition, this is a funny quote, but the price of ambition is hunger. If you want to start a business, you've got to go hungry. That's your way of acquiring capital. Um, so most people have done that at some stage. Or, in the end, Gouled ended up selling drugs. So he was selling cat, this narcotic leaf that the Somalis chew. They do, they do this because it's a stem and you strip the leaf with your, with your teeth. But he ended up selling, selling drugs and he earned a bit of commission and it's, it's not illegal in Kenya. Um, so it's not quite, it doesn't have quite the same connotations. But that's what he ended up doing, to try and participate in this grey economy. And it, it, in a way, it's even more ironic, because, of course, at the same time as you have the legitimate Kenyan economy, you have this grey economy in Dadaab, and the politicians, of course, are taking advantage of that. So there's one of the characters in the book is a young guy called Nisho. And every time I interviewed him, he used to show up really tired, with red eyes and exhausted. I said, Nisha, wh what are you doing? He said, oh, I've been working all night. I said, working, doing what? He said, unloading sugar trucks. I said, oh, OK. So what, tell, explain to me how it works. And he said, well, it's the biggest business in Dadaab. There's, Kenya produces its own sugar, and there's 100% tariffs on the import of sugar. So the big politicians in Kenya, the vice president in particular, import hundreds of tonnes of sugar from... Uh, that arrives from Dubai into 
Somalia, and then it comes across the border tariff-free, and it gets bagged by Nisho into um, Kenyan national parastatal sugar bags, and then it gets sold in Nairobi at a markup of three or four times. Um, it's the, probably one of the biggest illicit businesses in Kenya. It's worth about $400 million a year. Um, and that is what, that's how I discovered... I wrote a big report that almost got me banned from Kenya on the sugar business. But I found out about it because Nisho used to come to his interviews with me completely exhausted <laughs> and telling me about what he was doing at night. So Dadaab functions on many levels as a, 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 a very important part of the Kenyan economy. It's the third largest city in Kenya. It's the biggest market between Mogadishu, Nairobi, and Addis Ababa. So in that whole Horn of Africa, it's a very important sort of crucible. Mm, so someone like Nisho is right at the bottom of that kind of increasingly corrupt, with a lot of people at the top making a lot of money from it. Yes, yes. And, and a lot of the ups and downs in Nisho's personal life are connected to the vicissitudes of the illegal sugar racket. So when, when there's an election coming and the market's flooded because the politicians need money, the sugar's cheap and he's not getting paid so much, uh, or he's working too much and his wife is complaining. Um, this, you know, all, these, all this sort of... You, what, you see um, this, into this global illicit trafficking, all racketeering, all through the prism of his own life, which I think is, is very interesting. Fascinating, yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, you, t you touched on this earlier, the, the fact that there are now more than three generations of people who've come through the camp, grown up through the camp, lived, born, lived, died in the camp. But the traumatic effect on that many generations and more of living in a war-torn country, being forced to flee their homes and then live in a camp like Dadaab and make their lives there, there's a, a, something you say at the end of the prologue Neither the past, nor the present, nor the future is a safe place for a mind to linger for long. And that, I really love this phrase. And then you continue, you say, to live in this city of thorns is to be trapped mentally as well as physically, your thoughts constantly flickering between impossible dreams and a nightmarish reality. But this, this question of trauma is, is a huge one, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, impacts on mental health, but, but that sense of entrapment... Well, it puts amazing pressure on people's personality. So one day I would meet, uh, there's, there's a guy in a book called Tawane, who's a very successful businessman who um, has inherited almost the trauma of his father. He, he never witnessed the war firsthand, but he's heard all these stories. And that means that for him, Somalia is completely out of bounds because it's this, it's this horror show. Um, it's this land of ghosts that he doesn't want to, to go to. to, go to. But he's stuck in this terrible situation in the camp. So one day you go to him and say, oh, Tawani, how's things? Oh, you know, not good. My sister's gone to Canada. She was resettled. And it's not my turn. And it's, I'm always, I'm going to be here. I'm going to die here. This is terrible. It's awful. Um, the next day you go and see him and say, oh, how's it going? And he says, oh, well, I, uh, my friend is in Kismayo and he tells me that things are good over in, back in Somalia and maybe I can survive there. And then you see him the next day, and he says, oh, how are you doing, Tawani? And his plans have changed. It's, no, actually, now I've just invested in a, um, uh, in a new ice machine, and I'm, you know, I'm going to make money, and life in Dadaab is great. It's, it, this is my home. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to die here. And it's all... But every day, his idea of himself is changing. So this, this sort of pressure cooker of the camp means that people have come up with different personalities, different personas every day of the week. Um, and it's always changing based on the politics and the, you know, which is always true for all of us to a mm. certain extent, but it's, to, you know, that pressure is increased. So now coming much more up to date and thinking about the situation now in Dadaab and where things might go in the next few years, um, I think it was an article you wrote in the New York Times, you said... Dadaab is not an anachronism or a hangover from a former world order. It is the future. Where, where are we going with this now? Where, what, how do you mm. see things evolving in Dadaab? Well, one of, the reason, one of the lessons, I think, and one of the reasons I think Dadaab is so interesting and also urgent that we understand it is because um, it's, an, it's, a rash, it's a natural response to the political failure to deal with refugees. So... 
it was established in the 90s under the UN regime um, as a temporary place. And the idea was it would hold people for a set period of time and either there would be peace in Somalia and you would go home or you would integrate into your new host country, which is Kenya, or the international community would step in and take a share of those refugees for resettlement elsewhere through the UN quota system. That, in theory, is how things are supposed to work. But the theory is breaking down because these wars in the 21st century are not really ending. All that's happening is that there's a political declaration, there's a democratic election, and then everybody pulls out and it's peace in Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere, lots of countries in Africa, except it's not. Um, and even the peace that is called peace um, is... Is, is actually not a stable situation that people want to stay in. So one of the biggest refugee-generating countries in the Horn of Africa is Ethiopia, which is apparently a bastion of stability and the recipient of lots of EU aid, but in fact is pumping out refugees like no tomorrow because it's an incredibly repressive regime with no opportunities for young people. So the, the definition of peace has changed. The Host countries don't want to absorb um, large flows of refugees. They never did, but they're getting more and more resistant. And they're, in part, they're getting resistant because the international community is not playing its role. So previously, we're from Somalia, tens of thousands of refugees were resettled every year in the 90s into Europe, into America, um, elsewhere. Now the number is right down. It's a trickle. You've got around 2,000 a year being resettled out of Dadaab. The birth rate in Dadaab is 1,000 a month. So as soon as you've got a big population like that, they're only going to grow. And this, the strategy of camps has become a kind of permanent political tool. So now the EU has just given half a billion dollars to build three massive camps in Turkey. Well, it's two years ago now. They're up and running. And we're outsourcing... Um, the, the job of refugee hosting. The same in a lot of investment in the camps in Jordan, elsewhere, these holding centres where nobody wants to regularise, the American word, for the status of those people. They don't want to go back. Um, so what do you do? And what's going to happen is these limbo cities are becoming permanent. So Calais is now nearly is 20 years old. Dadaab is 25 and, gr and growing, 26 years old. The camps in, on the border between Thailand and uh, Myanmar are 50 years old. Um, Gaza is 45, how long, you know, 47, how long is that? So it's, that is becoming the norm. This, these cities, these states of limbo where people don't have normal, regular rights. So you have, human rights are not universal. You have tiers of rights now. And even within the EU, you don't have, it, it's supposed to be the principle that if you're a refugee or asylum seeker and you're a citizen, you have equality before the law. Not at all. Because you've got all these different humanitarian protection, asylum seeking, refugee, and even then those rights can be stripped if you buy a TV from the wrong place or find yourself on the wrong side of the law, all of a sudden you're, you're in indefinite detention in, in the UK. So I, I see these limbo cities as the future, and that unfortunately is, is not a happy vision, but that's how I see it going. Mm. And yet there are camps like Calais, which was never an official UN or mm. you know, refugee camp, but the French government didn't want it there, so finally demolished it in October of November 2016 so that they could officially say there is no more camp here. Mm. But where do all those people go? There were not enough places for them to go elsewhere. And of course, most of those people living in Calais didn't want to go and live in rural France somewhere in a refugee centre. They were in Calais because that was the closest place to the UK and that was the only way they were going to get a chance to get across the channel and into the UK. Similarly, on the border between... Greece at Idomeni, again, a massive unofficial camp of people trapped at a border, not able to move, looking living in a railway station. Yeah. And again, 
moved out, but where do they all go? And it? yesterday in Tijuana, the Mexican authorities yes. destroying the camps on the border there. Mm -hmm. And it, we're seeing it more and more, and it's not just far away in yeah. Africa or the Middle East, but it's actually within Europe, within our own countries. And those borders exist for some people, but not for others. And it's a, it's a very dangerous situation, I think. Mm. So I'd like to open this up to some questions from the audience. I hope we have some questions. I think there's a roving mic. I can't see very well, but yeah, I think there's a roving mic at the back. So let's see. Put your hand up if you have a question. Yes, at the very back there. Hard to see. Um, I just want to thank you both for an amazing presentation. It's, uh, it's such a wake-up call, really, to hear this on a Saturday morning as we sit in our comfortable lives drinking takeaway coffees and what have you. Um, so I have two questions, Ben, and, and Sarah as well, just to ask you is, one is a huge macro kind of question, um, is about, it's about um, the value, I suppose, of, of, of humankind, you know, or, or the value of people. And is there any way that you think that we can turn our, people's thoughts around or people's, to, ex, to accepting refugees as an asset, because you talked about that city now becoming, it's a huge e economic kind of center. And people, as you say, are so resourceful and resilient that they can create a kind of commerce that works in a really dysfunctional way there. And that is something that one would imagine would be welcome in cities or in, in countries that are so denuded of people and commerce and all of those things. So my first question is, and it's a, I know it's a huge question, is how can we, and also all the things I've read about immigrants coming into countries is nearly always, is, is almost always positive and they bring economic benefit to every country that they go to. So that's the big question, is how can you turn that, is, do you think that can be turned around? Okay, it's a mm -hmm. bit of a Pollyanna question. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the second question then is, to people like us sitting here listening to these stories and you know, so inspirational what you've, what, what you've both achieved. What would you say, in a very practical way, what is the best thing to do? Or maybe a menu of five really good things to do. Hmm. Just to, that we could take away from here, rather than thinking we cannot solve anything. We can't, it's too big, it's ridiculous, yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Just to say to us, if you could do five things, or even if you could do one thing, yeah. what would you say, what can you do? I don't think it's, a, that it's a, a ridiculous question or a ridiculous ambition either. Um, the, it's very easy to get swamped by despair. And actually, there are quite a few countries and places that are doing very interesting and inspiring things. And you're, it's absolutely right that all the research shows refugees are a net benefit to uh, any economy. You look at the strength of the US economy today. Where did that? Who built that? <laughs> um, you know, Obama's very f um, fond of, of pushing that message, but it needs to be pushed relentlessly. Um, all of the arguments against refugees are irrational. They don't make rational sense, either economically or morally. Um, but it's, it's appealing to the darker side of human nature rather than the positive side. And that's where, that's the answer to your second question. Um, so there are countries that are doing interesting things, and, and individual municipalities. So you've got the Cities of Sanctuary movement in the UK. I don't know if that has any corollaries in, in Ireland. You've got the Universities of Sanctuary movement, which is global, um, educating refugees. You've got thousands of very exciting interest, um, individual organisations doing things. You've got municipalities in southern Italy, where they've had a, a lot of population flight, um, who are bidding from the Italian government for refugees, the same in Spain, the same in Portugal, um, and you've got countries like Portugal and Canada, which are very strategic and very compassionate and are recognising that refugees are the future of their economy and they are welcoming more and more. So Canada keeps increasing its quotas for refugees. And um, Justin Trudeau, I don't agree with him on the tar sands, but I do agree with him on his refugee policy, that they've been fantastic in encouraging um, refugees, and they've, they've done studies, the Canadian government has commissioned studies looking at um, the biggest foreign exchange earners in their higher education sector, and it is the tech industry which is being driven by young Canadian 
first-generation immigrants. So there are, there are points of light out there. There are hopeful bits and pieces and stories. Um, another example, um, in Tanzania, they, 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 national, um, they gave a, a, an amnesty to Burundian refugees after 20 years, and all of those Burundians immediately became Tanzanians and are building new lives in, in Tanzania now. So there, there are a lot of positive stories as well, although the, the overwhelming news and feeling in Europe is very negative because of the populism, there are um, some, some good examples out there. And that feeds into the second thing, which is, for me, this is about politics and, and progressive action in general, about the way we all live our lives and the choices that we all make every day. Um, and if you're... First, the first job, I think, of, of being a, a, an engaged citizen is to be informed. So the first thing is to find out what's going on, find out what policies are, are in place. How do you feel about that? Are you happy with that? Should, and, and, and put political pressure. So the, the letter writing campaign, the movements to lobby, for example, in the UK, we had a big movement to allow um, individual towns and municipalities to sponsor families, which is now going through as an, as an amendment to one of the Refugee Acts, so that community can sponsor families. So that you can say, well, we don't agree with the national policy, but we as a town or we as a city are going to sponsor a family from uh, a war-afflicted country and we're going to look after them. And uh, again, there's lots of research to show that a family that's adopted by a village has far better indicators than some, another family that just disappears into a big urban city. So there, those are two possibilities. And um, like I tried to do with the book, I tried to build... Uh, empathy and connections between people. And that can be done through a letter, write, you know, a pen pal between a school and a school in a refugee camp. There are plenty of opportunities to do that. I can put you in touch with schools in a refugee camp if you're a teacher and you'd like a uh, class to write to. So children can begin to understand and when they grow up, hopefully they'll have a, 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 at least an insight, a little bit of a window in, into the fact that life is different elsewhere. There are lots of in, I think, small things that, that we can do to build a more enlightened society. And that, but that goes to the heart of um, citizenship in general, I think. I would agree. And I think that, you know, the, the, the stories you read in the media are inevitably <coughs> generalised, sweeping. And for me, the thing is, find those individuals, find the connections, build empathy, meet people, meet people who are refugees in your towns, find organisations, work with organisations who organise walks, meetings, translation projects, language teaching, music, whatever it is, so that people, you know, you can actually find ways to build a community and, in, and welcome people into your community and, and also understand, I have this conversation with my parents all the time about meeting people, I say, yeah, that person you just met is a Syrian refugee, and they go, oh, oh, uh, hang on a minute. Um, <laughs> and it suddenly, they go, oh, but that's immediately, and it sounds really obvious, changes their perception just by meeting somebody because they've not understood. Well, yeah, I think it's, in, it's very interesting. <laughs> Generally speaking, whenever, so, whenever somebody, even a hardcore um, xenophobe, meets a refugee, they usually want to help mm. because... I, th I still have a, a, a faith in human nature, and I've, I've seen it quite a lot, actually, that when you, when you meet somebody face-to-face, -face, they, they can't r run into their house and empty their wardrobe fast enough. You know, it's, I want to help that, that individual person. Oh, yes, I don't want all those immigrants coming, but this person, I really want to help them. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of populism is actually about fear. And I don't mean fear in a general sense. I mean fear of personal responsibility. Because when you do empathise with somebody else, and I share your feeling and I, I want to help you, all of a sudden, I, that, that jeopardises my, my own situation, my own plans for the day, my own plans for the money in my bank account. Because all of a sudden, I'm being driven by emotion. And I'm inviting you to stay in my spare room. I'm cooking you a meal. I'm finding out about your grandchildren. And we have a relationship. And that relationship, all of a sudden, invites change. And that means that people are afraid of stepping out of their comfort zones. But the rewards, if you do, are very exciting. So we have a, where I live in Wales, we have a refugee, uh, it's called a sanctuary group because Powys County Council won't have any refugees in Powys. So we invite refugees from Newport and Cardiff to come and have a day in the mountains 
um, and see some greenery. Um, that's the only way we, <laughs> we can, our refugee group can actually meet refugees. But it's very successful. And a lot of people have come in who were quite closed to begin with, but all of a sudden have now made these very strong relationships. People are coming up for the weekend. There's cookouts. There's pizza making. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Relationships forming where you would never have expected. Um, but it, it's that sort of fear of responsibility, mm. in a way. Not, not fear of, of, of physical danger, of being assaulted by refugees, but fear of your own reaction, actually. Mm. Another question. Can't see any hands up. You've gone very quiet. Yes. <laughs> I don't think hope is in, um, is in any kind of jeopardy. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because the experience of Dadaab has taught me that it's, you, you just can't extinguish it. Try as you might, it's like a fire in a peat bog. You know, it just keeps going somehow because um, struggle actually generates hope. It's not the other way around. You don't need hope in order to keep going. It's that the fact of keeping going generates the hope. Um, and, and that's something which is, I think, remarkable in the, um, in the camp, is that so many people don't give up. Because if you looked at the situation rationally, you would say, this is, you know, forget it. Um, and there are suicides, there are one or two, usually among the students who don't get the grades necessary to get the, the, the one route out of the camp, apart from the UN resettlement system or the illegal route to Italy, is a... Um, a Canadian scholarship and 10 boys and 10 girls every year get selected for the Canadian scholarship. One of the um, stories in the book is about a girl trying to get on that list. And the, the suicides are mostly among young people who don't make it onto that list because they were smart kids and they were hoping that they would. But generally speaking, um, people are manufacturing that hope every day. They're telling themselves stories. And yes, they might be fanciful stories, but... To, I see a parallel here with, with the rest of us, that we're all doing that to some extent. We're all telling ourselves a story about our life which is either closely related or not that related to our actual life. Um, and that's something that we're all doing all the time. And we're, again, uh, the parallel with us now in living in hydrocarbon societies in an age of climate change, we know burning fossil fuels is our death warrant but we do it all the, every day anyway. And we, there's a certain amount of denial and hope that has to coexist in order to keep going. And that's precisely the mindset that's going on in the refugee camp. So I see that more, the endurance of hope as a kind of, is a fact of the human condition. Um, the level of denial that accompanies it is, um, is the interesting thing. <laughs> and and how, do we, uh, you know, how do we actually use the hope to reduce the denial? And address some of the some of the other problems. There was another question, yes. I think, in the. Do you want the microphone? It's just coming. <laughs> I grew up with a, a very sheltered house, happy, really nice, loving background. I have no idea of what the people you've met or, or have gone through in their lives, nor can I understand it. And my parents decided as we grew up to buy us a Christmas present, which really pissed us all off as kids, which was an, an animal in Africa that they bought through Goethe or something. So we all got a present of a cow or a donkey or a sheep. And we were looking at my mom and dad going, what the, what have you done to us? Why, why have we been so bold to deserve such crap present? And they were trying to introduce this idea that yeah. we're so lucky and, but it ruined Christmas for us. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember it forever. And, and here I am listening to your story. So, you know, you see ads on television help some child with an eye disease or help some child who's starving or help some adult family who've been blown up and separated. Is there a, do you ever see governments providing systems where we can sponsor a person <laughs> rather than a donkey or a cow or a sheep? Is there ever going to be a, a system between countries that we can bring people mm. to our country and put them in a spare bedroom and give yep. them school? 
because it seems like it, it's hopeless. You ask a, a very good question, and it connects to the question from the lady at the back. In Canada, it's part of your right as a Canadian citizen to be able to invite other people to become Canadian citizens. So in Canada, you have a, a church or a community group can sponsor um, a refugee from Dadaab or anywhere you choose to come. And you have to raise the cost of their living expenses and the cost of, of relocation and, and the, the immigration procedure. I think it's around 70,000 Canadian dollars. But if you, you as a church group can raise that money, then you can do it. Or, or it's mostly church groups in Canada, but it can be a village. Um, so yes, and it's a, it's a right. And I've often felt that actually my, my rights as a citizen in the UK are curtailed. My right to empathy, my right to a relationship with somebody else, or my right to care or look after somebody else is actually been severed by the state, by the Home Office, because they say you can't invite somebody. I mean, ever since I was 18 and I was teaching English in Africa, making friends and trying to invite them to come to the UK and getting my parents to give me their bank statements so I could get them visas. That, you know, that right has been more and more and more curtailed. But it should be a right, and that's something that the, the Canadian experience was the basis on which, the, in the UK, communities lobbied for the right to sponsor. So in the UK, it's limited. You can, you can have some... Um, <clears throat> you can look after a community that or a family or an individual who is already part of the, the quota. So Brit the British government promised 10,000 refugees from Syria. You can bid for one of those 10,000. The Canadian system is much more advanced. So the discussion there is about the citizen, um, citizenship sponsorship project has to be outside of the government quota. So the government quota exists, and then the citizenship um, sponsorship program is in addition and there's been a big fight about keeping it separate not subsuming it into the quota so that's I think a very interesting basis for a campaign in Ireland or any other country to say we as citizens want the right to be able to extend a helping hand and that's a human right and it has a basis in law and you could run that campaign um, so I absolutely I think you're onto something <laughs> 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 I'm sure there's some, there must be a refugee council in Ireland or somebody like that who can advise you on the legality of it but if there were others who were interested in pushing something there is a legal basis and precedent yeah. it started here <laughs> <laughs> great the question here at the front I want to thank you both for an extremely interesting and informative uh, talk um, Sarah, I was really taken back by your exhibition during the summer in the Arts Festival. Mm. Wonderful work altogether. My question is to you, Ben. Um, in terms of the camps, I'm interested to know what is the um, health status of all of these? Have, have they access to antibiotics and whatever? And are there such things as um, primary care centres, health centres? I'm sure the people arrive exhausted, dehydrated and... And you say that there's births of about, was it a thousand a day? A thousand a month. A thousand a month. What is the death rate? And uh, what are they dying of? The, I, the death rate is less than that. I don't know, uh, a lot less. Um, they're dying of, some people are dying of old age. Um, but the, the health stats in general are better than Somalia because you do have primary, um, primary care. So you've got three hospitals in the camp. One is run by Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. One is run by IRC, the International Rescue Committee, based in the US. Um, and the other one is run by the Islamic Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent, Red Crescent organization. So there's three hospitals. They are pretty stretched. Um, they, there are no drugs, because the, there's a lot of corruption in the UN funding process, and the people make money out of the out of the drugs, but there is a um, the UN does provide healthcare and and education for free. Uh, it's supposed to be free. Lots of bribes, changing hands, and often access is a problem. But it's better than um, Somalia, and it's actually better than large parts of rural Kenya. So f one of the things that's happened in the last ten years in the camp is they've tried to weed out fifty thousand Kenyans who are living in the camp. 
because it's a city. There are jobs, there are, there's free education, the Kenyan system, you're supposed to pay for um, school books, uniform, all sorts of stuff. If you can get yourself registered as a refugee, and of course a lot of people in northern Kenya are of Somali ethnicity and Somali descent, so you can't tell the difference, um, that actually they are in the camp in order to access services, and that's been a huge problem for the UN and for the, for the Kenyan government. So it's actually a lot better than, than other places. So back to Gouled and his wife, Mariam now, she went, they had all sorts of fights and problems about the camp. She went back to Mogadishu, but she came back to the camp again when she needed to go to hospital, when she had a, um, a need for an operation, because the healthcare in the camp is still better than what is in, what is in Somalia. I think maybe we've got time for one last question. If there's one last question from anyone. If not... No, we're off the hook, we're... Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, great. Well, it just remains for no, me to... A, oh, is there a hand a or is that an itch? I can't see. <laughs> You're going to have to raise your hand higher if it is a question. No, no I don't think it is. Okay. Well, thank you, Ben. Please join me in thanking Ben for his illuminating... Oh, thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs>